This is a story about notable golf teacher and long drive hitter Mike Austin. And while some of you might think you know the story of Mike Austin, believe me, I can guarantee you, you've never heard this. So stay tuned. Hey, this is Steve from HitItLonger.com. Mike Austin was an extremely colorful character and definitely not without controversy. But even his harshest critics cannot refute that he was an extremely knowledgeable golf instructor who at one point was held in such high esteem that he was voted in for a top five slot in the prestigious Golf Digest Top 100 Instructors list just behind the likes of David Ledbetter and Butch Harmon. Nor can they refute that Mike had an incredibly powerful and fluid golf swing that could easily drive the ball over 300 yards in an era where the average pro's good drive was about 250 yards. Now, of course, Mike is most famous for his 515-yard blast in the 1974 National Senior Open. One point, it made the Guinness Book a world records. Now, Mike's critics will point to a number of his fanciful stories that seem to have been completely made up. And in some cases, they're right. Certainly, history has proven that Mike was quite fast and loose with the truth, but you could never tell which one of his stories were completely false, which of them had a kernel of truth, and which of his stories were absolutely true. Let me give you some examples. Mike claimed that he was born on the Isle of Guernsey, one of the Channel Islands between England and France in 1910. And after growing up in Atlanta, he attended Georgia Tech and Emory. Now, all three of these claims are entirely provably false, as, as not only Mike's birth certificate and the 1940 census both prove that Mike was born in 1915 in Alabama. You can also see on the 1940 census that Mike is listed as HS plus four, which means he attended four years of high school but never stepped foot in a college, not even a single day. You can also corroborate that through the Georgia Tech yearbooks, where looking at the appropriate years that where Mike might have been a freshman, he is absolutely not listed. Now, many of Mike's stories seemed false on their face, but if you go and do a little deeper digging, you find that they had a kernel of truth or maybe were nearly completely true. For example... Mike once told a L.A. Times reporter in 1993 that he had gone over and played in the British Open in 1964 at St. Andrews. Supposedly, he shot 73-73, thought he had missed the cut, therefore he got on a plane and flew home, only to find out from the TV later that day that, in fact, he would have made the cut. Now, this is easily provable false by simply looking up the entire field scores for the 1964 British Open. And here I scroll down through the scores and I just simply don't see Mike Austin's name listed anywhere. So you might stop digging at this point and just assume that Mike was telling a whopper. But wait a minute, dig a little deeper and you'll see that Mike Austin actually was in Scotland in 1964 and what he was doing he was playing in a qualifier to get into the British Open. And by goodness, here he is shooting a 73 on the new course at St. Andrews. And in fact, he would have made the cut and gotten into the main field for the British Open had not for the fact that he, he thought he had missed the cut and he flew home. Here's further proof that Mike was in St. Andrews in 1964 is a photo of him standing in front of the clubhouse on the 18th green wearing his flammer, his patented invention. And then there were many of the stories of, that Mike used to tell that were completely true, that seem outlandish. But once you do some digging, you find out he was telling the complete truth. Now, Mike used to boast that he was a professional opera singer and that he had been in movies. So I did some digging and I came up with the fact that it's all true. Now, Mike starred in a, 
in a presentation in 1947 of the musical called Desert Song for the Los Angeles Civic Opera. Now, the L.A. Civic Opera at one point had been an extremely prestigious troupe bringing artists from New York and even London all the way to perform on the West Coast. Mike was also in movies. You can see he had a bit part in the movie Star Chamber in 1983 starring Michael Douglas. So you never really could tell if Mike Austin's stories held truth or didn't. Now, one of Mike's craziest stories was about crashing a plane in North Africa in a swamp during World War II. Now, of course, this seems crazy and completely made up. So Mike claimed that his original British citizenship allowed him to join up with the Royal Canadian Air Force. But after a thorough check of their archives, there's just simply no record of any Michael Hoke Austin ever serving during the war. And because of Mike's history of creating fiction, this is where I thought the story originally ended with Stolen Valor and just another one of Mike's crazy fantasies. But thanks to a tip from Jeff Martin, who I consider to be one of golf's greatest living historians, the story ended up having a crazy twist. You see, back in World War II, by the summer of 1941, the British were facing absolute disaster in North Africa. German Field Marshal Rommel's armor divisions were besieging Tobruk, threatening to gain control of the Suez Canal. A battle-damaged Royal Air Force urgently needed a repair base in the region. Desperate for aid, Britain called upon America, who as yet had not entered the war. By presidential directive, a secret meeting was convened with representatives of the nation's top plane makers. The result was a top-secret repair base designated Project 19 would be established at Gura in the Eritrean Hills, 60 miles from the Red Sea port of Masawa. High on a mountain plateau lay an abandoned Italian airplane plant, complete with luxury barracks, well-equipped machine shops, and new hangars. Recruitment and management were assigned to Douglas Aircraft. Now remember that name, Douglas Aircraft. Under an oath of the strictest secrecy, volunteers were drawn from the principal U.S. airplane manufacturing centers, Seattle, the Midwest, and Southern California. Now, the Boeing and Douglas men who rode the first trucks from Misawa, winding up hundreds of curves to Gura, saw a mile-high desert valley that reminded Californians of the Upper Mojave. They also saw a pitted airstrip surrounded by a rubble of bombed-out barracks and shop buildings, the remains of the Italian plant, which had been blasted by Allied bombers months earlier. Awaiting them was a field littered with ruined aircraft, along with crates of battered wings, fuselages, empennages, and engines. The Americans regarded them with dismay. Their task was to make these aircraft battle-worthy. But how, they asked themselves, with what tools? Bereft of even the barest necessities, they responded with the only resource available to them, Yankee ingenuity. Tools were improvised and salvaged from ship cargoes. Barrack walls and roofs were patched. Bomb craters were filled in. There were forests of propellers to be straightened, but no hydraulic press to do the job. The machinist contrived a simple vise to hold the bent props, then proceeded to unbend them manually with the longest available 2x4. They made a crude but accurate level steel table and a homemade protractor to check the pitch and curve of the blades. They improvised a balance stand and pit. From junk steel, aluminum, and rubber, they built a working bench to test the flow of oil through pitch controls. One day on the docks of Misawa, the Americans discovered a new German milling machine created and bound for Japan. With part of the group creating a suitable diversion, the milling machine was gleefully liberated, then trucked over the hills to Gura. As the days went by, proper machine tools arrived, one by one, to replace the original makeshifts. Soon, the members of Project 19 were fixing every kind of plane that limped or was hauled in from nearby North American fighting fronts. They serviced and assembled P-40s, 
C-47 sky trains, B-24 and B-17 bombers, amongst a host of others. Those that couldn't be repaired were dismantled for spare parts. Now, on October 23, 1942, the third and final battle of El Alamein commenced with continuous attacks from RAF aircraft. Many of the Allied planes had been patched together by Project 19. By November 4th, the Axis forces in the Western Desert were in full retreat. No fuel had succeeded in reaching Rommel's forces for six weeks. Air interdiction, made possible by Project 19's field maintenance and repair, had tipped the balance in the Allies' favor. On March 19, 1943, the men of Project 19 heard the news. Rommel had abandoned North Africa. Soon after, in groups large and small, the exodus back to the U.S. began. Some by airplane, some aboard ship by the way of Australia. Then one day in late 1943, a small group of machinists, the last remnant of 2,500 civilians and 500 soldiers, nailed the final crate, heaved it on the bed of the last truck, and rode the six-wheeler down the escarpment road to the Red Sea. An absolutely amazing story, wouldn't you agree? Now, how does Mike Austin fit into this? Well, you see, Douglas Aircraft was located at, in Santa Monica during the war. And, incidentally, Mike Austin lived right nearby. Here's a photo of the building he lived in. At this time, Mike Austin lived in the neighborhood of Ocean Park, which is sandwiched between Santa Monica and Venice, and just a few blocks away from the Santa Monica Airport where Douglas Aircraft Corporation was located. So Mike Austin signed up for the initial World War II draft on October 6, 1940. Here is his draft card. You can see in the upper right hand corner that due to his high draft number he was not initially called up. But just down the street, Douglas Aircraft was assembling a civilian corps of 2,500 technicians, mechanics, engineers, and the like. Mike volunteered for this group in 1941 and later was shipped out from South Carolina on May 28, 1942 aboard the U.S. Chateau Thierry. Here's Mike's name on the passenger manifest. He would have flown to New York, took a train to South Carolina, put aboard this ship, and he sailed off. Notice he is listed on the manifest as a civilian employee for Douglas Aircraft Incorporated. Now the ship sailed south around the Cape of Good Horn, destined for Eritrea. From there it was just a simple 10-hour truck ride through the desert to the top secret base the U.S. had restored. Now, this is where part of Mike Austin's story gets really wild. While in Africa, Mike claims to have crashed a booze-laden plane into a crocodile-infested swamp. He says, I made the biggest scotch in water in the whole damn world. And then a crocodile swam up between my legs and my blood absolutely congealed. So, if you were one of Mike Austin's students, you probably heard that story. Now, once Rommel had retreated from North Africa and the top-secret Project 19 mission had come to an end, Mike was sent back, first stopping in Bombay, India, on his way back to New York City, where he arrived on April 10, 1943, on the SS Mariposa. Here is his name on the passenger manif manifest arriving at the Port of New York. You can see that the SS Mariposa had originated on this trip in Eritrea. So you can see the wild story that Mike Austin participated in a top secret World War II mission is absolutely a true story. Now, as far as the plane crash goes, let me leave you with one final nugget. There is evidence that Mike Austin actually took flying lessons in Atlanta in 1939. So even that part of the story could be true. Now, after the war, Mike Austin lived on 5th Street, which is much closer to downtown L.A., right down the street from the Veterans Administration on Vermont. Now, down the hall from the VA in a small office was the National Academy of Advanced Sciences, where Mike 
purportedly received a PhD in kinesiology. But my friends, that's a story for a different time. So one of Mike's craziest stories that he ever told was likely 100% true. And just as one Mike Austin researcher put it, the deeper you dug into Mike Austin's stories, the more truth you found. So hey, I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope you'll give it a like if you did, and leave a comment down below if you'd like to hear more about Mike Austin. I'm Steve, thanks so much for watching, and as usual, I'll either see you in the next video, or I'll see you longer and straighter down the fairway. Everybody take good care.